Hi, I'm Sophia, and I'm here at the Geek Group. Today, we're going to be looking at some basic sewing techniques. Before you can start sewing, though, you need the right tools, and I've laid them out in front of me. So these are the tools we're going to use in this project. Our first tool is this pair of scissors. These are gingers. They are the finest scissors that you can buy for sewing. They're somewhat expensive, but you can often get them half off if you have a coupon, and they're worth it. They're very, very sharp. You need to be careful when you are using these scissors. If you are a small child, you should not use these scissors. If you're a teenager and your dendrites haven't finished growing and you're kind of clumsy, you probably shouldn't use these scissors. I'm just saying. You're also going to need a pair of snips. Now I happen to have a sewing machine over here that is so fantastically awesome that it will cut my threads for me, but I find that a little intimidating. Like the cyborgs are going to take over the world intimidating. So I have snips, and snips are used to cut thread. You don't want to cut thread with your awesome gingers because it will dull your blade. You want a cheap pair of snippy snip snips to cut your thread. I've also got two kinds of pins. My first kind of pin is the kind of pin that I'm going to be using mostly in this project. They have a nice yellow head on them, and they're made out of steel, I think. Most of the time, these get picked up by a magnet when I drop them on the floor. I have a nice, super powerful magnet at home. I find them very useful. I tend to drop a lot of pins. I also like the fact that it's got a yellow head on the top because it makes it easy for me to see the pins when I've left them in the fabric. Now, sometimes I want to mark something special, like an end point where I'm going to stop sewing on my fabric. And for that reason, I got super fancy pins. Look, these have hearts. And they're pretty pearly colors, because I'm a girl. But you can actually find pins with other colors um, that just have a, a, a head like this one. That's just a round head. And those can be useful. You don't need them. But they can be useful if you have to mark where you're going to start or stop sewing in a line. I've got a seam ripper. Seam rippers are important no matter how many times or how many years you've been sewing. You're going to make mistakes, and you're going to have to rip out those seams. And if you have a seam ripper, it's going to make it a lot easier. Now, this is an ergonomic seam ripper, which I think is overkill, but since I've had one, I'm really happy with it. So you can get an ergonomic seam ripper if you want to. They come in three sizes. This is the medium size. I've also got ribbon because we're going to do a drawstring on our garment today. I've got two colors of chalk. Now, normally, I only need one color of chalk. But because we're doing a bunch of projects today, some of them are on white fabric, which will need blue chalk, and some of them are on dark fabric, which will need white chalk. I'm also going to be using bias tape. A little bit later, I'm going to teach you how to make your own casing, which is what we're going to be using the bias tape for. I'm not going to teach you how to make bias tape, because it's actually a lot more complicated than I'm willing to present in a video today. This is for beginners. This uh, video is specifically for people who haven't sewn before and are interested in getting their toes wet and not a whole lot else. Finally, we're going to need one safety pin. And we have a backup safety pin. And our safety dinosaur, which I have it under strong authority, is not accurate. So children, beware. All right, now that we have all our tools set up for today, we're going to start with the actual project. So let me just clear these out of the way. Today, I'm going to take a tablecloth, and I'm going to turn it into a skirt. Now, we're really lucky, because this tablecloth actually has a ruffle on the edge already, which means we're going to have a ruffled skirt, which is a whole lot of effort that we don't have to go to to get a cool piece of clothing. Now, the basic shape for the skirt that we're going to be making today is a circle. We're going to cut a nice big hole in the circle in the middle, and then we're going to gather it and put a drawstring on it, and that's going to be the top of our skirt. And I'm going to talk about how wide this has to be in a little bit. You could use this exact same technique to make some other things, too. You could take a circle like this and put a smaller circle in the middle, add some ribbons, I'll show you how in a little bit, and make a dress for your kid. Or you could take the circle that we're starting with today and put a smaller circle in the middle and a cut down the front, and you have a cape. I know. 
just like that. And there are people out there watching this video right now who are thinking to themselves, man, I really need a cape. This is easier than I thought. So if you need a cape, that's one way to do it. There are actually a whole bunch of things you can make out of this pattern, but those are three that we're going to talk about today. So I do have a piece of scratch paper and a pen that you saw a minute ago, and I'm also going to use a tape measure. You don't actually have to have a tape measure. You can use a piece of string. Uh, you can use your body when you're measuring things, but a tape measure is actually the easiest tool for this job, and I always have one not handy when I'm trying to do some sewing. This is the tablecloth that I managed to acquire for this activity. It is a half circle tablecloth. Now you got to be careful. You don't want an oblong tablecloth. An oblong tablecloth is an oval. Oval. You don't want an oval. You want it to be perfectly round. And you'll know that it's perfectly round when you fold it in half and all the parts match up. So this is clearly half a circle. And that's appropriate because it's been folded in half. I'm going to fold it at least four times, and that will give me a quarter of a circle. All of you who thought you would never use geometry again, you were wrong. Terribly, terribly wrong. If you're just starting geometry, now is the time to pay attention so you can use it later. I'm just saying. So this is my half, my quarter circle. And I want to make sure that the ruffle kind of lines up at the bottom. You can see that we've got an angle up here at the top, a point. Let me show you on the overhead. We've got a point up here. It's more or less a right angle. I guess it's not really a right angle, but it's good enough. Um, so that is the piece that we're going to be uh, cutting for the most part. Now, I'm only four foot two. So when I put this up to myself, it's a full length skirt. On anyone else, it's going to be um, to the knee or a little below the knee if you make this into a skirt. If you made it into a cape, it would fall probably to your hips. The uh, thing that we need to cut on this piece of fabric is up here. Now, this is one quarter of the actual space. So whatever I cut up here, I have to multiply by four in order to know how, how big it's going to actually be a circle. And because I am making a drawstring skirt, I don't want to measure the narrowest part of my waist. I want to measure the widest part of my hips because I'm going to have to get this skirt on over those hips. I'm going to tighten it by pulling on the drawstring. So when I measure, I want to have at least a minimum of the widest part of my hips. Now remember, so I'm taking this measurement and I'm measuring the widest part of my hips and then I'm going to add a couple of inches just to be safe because I don't want it to be too tight and it's not important for it to fit perfectly. That comes out to about 39. So I'm going to add two inches to be safe, making it 41. And I'm going to add one more inch for seam allowance. Now it's important to add that seam allowance piece there to everything. It doesn't actually matter in this case because of the particular use I'm going to put it to, but I can be careful, so I'm going to be careful. Now, I've got 42, but that's the whole measurement. I actually need to break that down. I'm going to divide it by four, and mostly that comes out to a little bit more than 10, because 40 divided by four, I'm um, divided by 10 is four. Four divided by four is 10. So this is not an exact science. You can actually be pretty loosey goosey here um, with this particular project. There are projects like quilting where you need to be very exact or couture design where you need to be very exact. But this is not one of those situations. I can do a little more than 10 and that works. So if I put this measure down, um, and make it a little more than 10, let's say 10 and a half. That's going to be about there. That's about right. Now, I could just willy-nilly cut this off in a, half, in a quarter circle. I could do that. It's not going to hurt anything if I do that. But I'm going to be classy, and I'm going to measure it. And then I'm going to use my chalk. So I'm going to keep my finger here, 
I'm going to see about how far this is, and it's 8 inches. So I'm going to start by marking with the white chalk, because it's a dark fabric, right there. And then I'm going to rotate. I'm going to keep the 8 at the corner, and I'm going to mark there. And then I'm going to mark halfway through with the 8-inch mark at the corner right here of the fabric. I'm just going to do that all the way around. And that will give me a fairly accurate curve for this fabric. I'm going to double check before I cut everything that it's all lined up against the edge there. That's true. It is always better to measure twice and cut once. Once you cut, you can't uncut. And there have been times where I have completely destroyed a thing I was working on because the fabric got folded over and I had these awesome gingers and they didn't even register that they had another two pieces of fabric they were cutting and I just cut my outfit in half. <laughs> So you always want to be really careful. Now, this is going to be the sewing line. This is the sewing line. This is the widest point of my body plus a little bit more. And I'm going to cut a little bit in from that. This is going to be the uh, seam allowance for the top of this skirt. Now, when I open this up, it's not going to be a perfect circle because I'm not a robot, and it's not going to matter even a little, just so you know. I now have a half circle here. If I were to open this thing completely, I would have a full circle. It would be a sphere in the middle. And if I hold this up to my person, you can't see it, but it goes down to my ankles uh, just about right. I'm going to leave my sewing scissors here because I'm not going to be using sewing, sewing fabric scissors over by the machine. I'm going to be using my snips. All right, so this is bias tape, and this is uh, something that we're going to be using today. What you really need to know about this bias tape is that it's extra wide and it's double fold. It doesn't look extra wide when you look at it. They have wider ones. But the real trick here is that it's double fold bias tape. I'm going to explain why that is in a minute. When you are purchasing bias tape, um, you want to get a color that matches what you're making. It can be contrasting color. That's OK. They make a variety of colors, but they don't make all the colors. You can also make your own bias tape. Or in the way we're using it today, it's going to be casing for our drawstring. And you can make casing out of any fabric that you're making your outfit out of. It's just a really long rectangle that you folded in a particular way. I'm going to show you what that looks like now. So this is what bias tape actually looks like when you open it up. That's folded, and this is what it looks like when it's open. You can see that it is um, a rectangle of fabric that's been folded in on both sides, and then it's folded one more time. It has one more feature that you may or may not be able to see very clearly in this picture, and that is that one side is a little bit longer than the other, and that's actually going to be important for what we're using this bias tape for later. Um, when you get really skillful at uh, sewing, you only need to attach the bias tape with pins to your fabric. You don't need the, to do the two-step process I'm teaching you today. But I'm teaching you the two-step process because until you're really good at sewing, your seam line is going to be kind of wiggly, and that's going to be a problem if you uh, don't do the two-step process. As you can see, if you are making your own bias tape, it's going to be really easy to do that. This is called bias tape because the uh, weave of the fabric is diagonal. And that means that it can really adjust. You can actually go around curves with this fabric and uh, when you are binding something off. Um, you can also make casing, which isn't cut on the diagonal. It's actually cut along with the threads of the fabric. You can make that from anything. It's just a rectangle. I've cut a square here. Um, with, that's folded in at the sides and then folded one more time. So if you have something and you want it all to match, it's got a pattern, you want the waistband to match the bottom, then you would make your own. 
And because we're short for time, I'm using bias tape. And if you're a new sewer, bias tape's really useful because it's already set up for you. It's already ironed. It's gonna work with your curves. It's all that kind of stuff. I'm gonna unwind a whole bunch of bias tape here. I'm gonna need at least 40 inches. Fortunately, this pack comes with three yards, so that's way more than I need. I also have to set up my garment to get ready for the bias tape. Now, because this garment is actually um, going to have a drawstring on it, I need to reinforce the area where the drawstring is gonna go. Because it's a circle, I can do this anywhere. I can do this anywhere. I'm gonna pick this spot right here. There is nothing special about this spot. It's on the circle, the circle's a circle. There's no near edge or far edge to the circle. And I'm just going to do a couple of things. I'm gonna make sure that I know where the right, the front edge of the fabric is. This is the part of the fabric that I'm gonna show when I wear this garment. And I know that because it's the part with the ruffle. And if I look on the other side, I can see that this is the unfinished edge. So I want to know where the right side and the wrong side of my fabric is. I'm going to follow it all the way up to the top. And then I'm going to rotate this edge towards me two times. This is called a rolled hem. We're only going to use a tiny little piece here. I'm going to roll it one time and two times like that. Let me do that one more time so you can see. I'm gonna roll it one time, and I'm gonna roll it another time. I only need this much. I don't even need that much. I just need a tiny little bit, and I'm gonna pin it. I could use my special fancy heart pins here, but because I'm only sewing between the two pin heads, I don't really need special fancy heart pins, so I'm gonna use the regular ones. Now I need to sew right here from this point to that point. This sewing machine is way more machine than you need if you're a beginner sewer. This machine can do everything. It even does buttonholes for you. It's ridiculous how powerful this machine is. Uh, if you are a beginning sewer, you don't need a machine like this. You might want one later, but you could start with a much less powerful machine. This particular machine has a couple of different settings for speed. I have it set on the medium speed, but I'm gonna put it down to the low speed so that you can really see what it's doing. I need to make sure that the stitch that I'm using is a straight stitch. In most machines, electronic or otherwise, this is the very first option because it's the one used most often. A straight stitch, doesn't have any zigzag in it. It just goes straight. That's why it's called a straight stitch. You're also going to see that I'm going to go forward a little bit on the sewing and then I'm going to back up using the back up button and then I'm going to go forward again. This knots the uh, thread in the fabric. I'm going to go nice and slow so you can see what I'm doing. I'm going forward a couple of stitches and now I'm gonna go back a couple of stitches. And now I'm gonna go forward to my other pin. You can see how slow this is going. If you're a new slower, this is gonna feel like you're on the freeway. And you're gonna be like, oh my God, it's coming towards my fingers, what do I do? But you'll be fine. And then back. Now, experienced sewers will notice I'm sewing over the pins. This is very bad. I am a bad person. Bad Sophia, no biscuit. Like you have no idea how bad this is. People who seriously sew, they should be yelling at me right now. But I am 41 years old and I have always sewn over the pins. And so far I have never lost an eye. Now the danger is the needle can hit the pin and it can bend the pin and you have to throw the pin out when that happens. The other thing that can happen is the needle can hit the pin and it can break and theoretically a piece of metal can fly out of your machine and hit you in the face. That could happen. I'm not kidding. But I live dangerously and taking out the pins takes a lot of time. Now I can't recommend that you leave the pins in, but you will see in this demo that I'm leaving the pins in. So I know that's a really mixed message, but there it is. Now I'm gonna lift the presser foot 
and I'm gonna pull out the threads and snip them with my snips, not my fabric scissors. And then I'm gonna pull out my pins. Now I have a nice neat edge on the fabric right here. I've used a contrasting color of thread so that you can see what I was doing. This is what a 40 plus inch circle looks like, by the way. So at this point, I'm going to attach the bias tape in the first step of our process. I want you to know that the part we just sewed with the fold here is the wrong side of the fabric. That's gonna be important for later. And that the side that doesn't have the fold is the right side of the fabric. I know it's the right side, and I'm gonna double check because it's really important to do this by looking down the fabric, and yep, there's my ruffle. This is the right side of the ruffle, so I'm doing the right thing. I'm now gonna open this bias tape all the way up. I have to find out where the long part is. Okay, that's the long part, good. So I'm gonna be attaching the side that is not the long side. If you look at the bias tape closed, you have a long side and a short side. I'm gonna be using the short side first. So I open it up, this is the short side, it's still the short side. I'm gonna open it one more time, this is still the short side. Okay, and now I have to finish the end, so I'm gonna do that double fold that we did before. I'm gonna do one time and two times. And now have it look like that, and I know, because I already double checked, that this is the short side. I'm gonna put the short side with the fold facing me against the piece that I prepared. This is the two-step process. Now I've got some business going on. It's not gonna be super smooth and awesome and cool because I did double fold it and I don't care deeply. It's gonna be inside the casing. It's not gonna matter a whole lot. So I'm just gonna line up the edge of the bias tape with the edge of the fabric in the giant circle that I cut into the fabric. Now the longer you sew, the fewer pins you need. When you first start sewing, you cannot use too many pins. You may take forever to pull them out as you come to them, but that is better safe than sorry. I'm doing a perpendicular pinning technique. You don't have to do a perpendicular pinning technique. You could do a, a pinning technique like that. If you pin along the line that you're sewing, you absolutely positively have to take the pin out. You can't sew over it. If you put the pin in perpendicular to where you're sewing, you can sew over it. And I'm just gonna work my way all the way around this garment. I'm putting in way more pins than I normally would. I'd probably freehand this because I've been sewing for a really long time and I totally know what I'm doing. The other nice thing about bias tape is that you are actually going to sew along the fold that you can see in the bias tape. So you have built-in directions for where you're gonna sew, you're gonna sew along that fold. This is gonna take me a bit. You probably will poke yourself. It happens. I have a friend who does a lot of sewing and she says that if you don't bleed for every single project, at least a little bit, then you have not appeased the sewing gods and your project won't work out. And so far I can attest that that's pretty true. Now, there are a couple of reasons to learn how to sew. The first reason is that it's really fun. And the second reason is that you can make clothes that fit you. That's why I learned to sew. I'm only four foot two. And if I didn't want to be stuck wearing my little pony, at, which by the way was around when I was little, um, or a Hello Kitty for the rest of my life, then I needed to learn how to sew clothes that suited me. 
So I learned how to make clothing when I was a teenager. The first thing I ever made was my junior prom dress. And it was ridiculous and way above my skill level. I think I had done like an A-line skirt before that and nothing else, like pillowcases. And I must have sewn every seam in that dress three times. I had to take them all out and do them again because I was really learning. But at the end of that, I knew how to make everything. It took me, by the way, the entirety of spring break, seven days, eight hours a day to learn how to do it. But I did. I'm self-taught, so I may give you advice and suggestions that are not typical for a formal class by a formal person who is formally trained to teach you how to sew. And that doesn't mean that what I'm doing is right or wrong or what your teacher tells you to do is right or wrong. There are different ways to do this. And you're going to find the way that works best for you. And tricks that some teacher comes up with are sometimes going to work for you and they're sometimes not going to work for you. And that's just how it is. Another really good reason to learn how to sew is that you can make things you like. I don't know how many times I have gone to back to school shopping, I'm a high school teacher, and the only thing in the stores were in like lime green or fuchsia, and I thought to myself, I can't wear those colors in front of my students, like I will look like I have malaria. So if you learn how to sew, then you can make clothes for yourself in any color you like and in any style you like. You don't have to wait for a style that suits you to come back into fashion. You can figure out what you like and what looks good on you and what's comfortable, and you can just make 20 of those in every color in the rainbow. Lastly, the clothing you make by hand lasts a really long time. Now, if you're a teenager and you're growing a foot every six months, this is not so helpful for you. Then disposable clothing is probably the best option because it's cheap and you're going to outgrow it anyway. But if you've settled into your size and you're pretty comfortable with it, you can make something and it'll last 10 years. In our culture of disposable clothing, this is really bizarre to us. I mean, if you buy something at a big box store where the fashions change every couple of weeks, those clothes are designed to break down so that you have to buy more. And combined with new styles, that's a way to get you to spend your money, which keeps the economy going, don't get me wrong. But if I make a piece of clothing from scratch and not from other things that I've picked up at the thrift store like I'm showing you now, but from scratch, scratch, it'll last 10 years before it wears out. That's 10 years of a piece of clothing that I absolutely love going in the washer on a regular basis and coming out again perfectly fine, being comfortable and fitting me in my favorite colors. And that makes sense. Now, if you are somebody who remakes clothing, also like me, then you're really going to like making your own clothes out of clothes that have already been made, where you repurpose something. And that's just good for the environment. Because if you are making clothes out of clothes that have already been made but have been cast off, then you're saving those things from going into a landfill. All right, I've come all the way around my circle. If I hold this up to the camera, you can see that it's, I'm all the way around the circle. I know the table's in the way, but there you go. So now I have to remember to measure off enough that I can fold it back and that it'll overlap almost with that piece that I already have. And then I'm going to snip it. So about here, notice how entirely I'm not measuring this carefully. This is, like I said, kind of a slapdash deal. I have to take this pin out because I wasn't thinking ahead. Now, once again, I'm going to do that double fold that I talked about, this finishing fold here. And I cut just enough to do that. And then I'm going to line it up here first. I may have to make the fold a little bit deeper. It may have cut too much. That's OK. There we go. And then I'm going to zhuzh it. This is a technical term, zhuzhing. Fabric is really stretchy. Even if it's not stretchy fabric, it's pretty flexible. So I can do all kinds of things with this fabric to make this fit, even though one of them's a circle and one of them's a straight line. And now I have it going all the way around the circle and all the way around the hole in the top. And now I'm going to do the first set of sewing. I'm going to speed this up a little bit because for me, this is really slow.
When you put it into the sewing machine, you have to remember to put your presser foot down. This machine has a red light that goes on if I don't push the presser foot down. If you don't have the presser foot down, uh, your threads will get all tangled. So if you're a new sewer and all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, my threads are tangling. I don't understand what's happening. It's because the pressure foot's probably not down. Now I've got my fabric in the machine and I've got my presser foot down. I'm going to be sewing along the line of the fold that is already in the bias tape. This is my guide. It's, I think, uh, half an inch, maybe not half an inch, but it's quite wide. It's about the width of the foot that I'll be using on the machine. So I'm actually just gonna run the foot along the edge of the fabric. That's, I may have to pull the pins out. Now, my left hand needs to make sure that I'm holding the fabric out of the way. I don't want the fabric to get bundled underneath and then run over it. That won't be any good. I'll have to get that seam ripper out. So I'm really going to have to pay attention to this extra fabric on the left side. And I'm gonna be checking the bottom as well to make sure that it's clear. Um, so you'll see me stopping and starting the sewing. I have to do a backup to knot it. I'm reinforcing that part where all the tension's gonna be. And now I'm just gonna slide along that groove that's already in the fabric. My needle is lined up with this cut in the metal of the foot. So that's how I know where I'm going. Now you'll see I'm totally running over my pins. This is a very bad thing, don't do this at home. Now, you can see I'm starting to get a fold here. In fact, I think I already messed up, so I have to check. I have to lift the foot. I have to cut the strings. I have to look underneath. Ugh! Do you see what I did there? I totally caught it. Thankfully, I have a seam ripper. It's right here. So this is how you use a seam ripper. I totally did not do this on purpose. Now, uh, you are going to slip the, uh, the point of the seam ripper, the sharp pointy part, don't put that through you, into the stitch, and there's a razor at the bottom, so you just slice through the thread. And you can go through the stitch and slice through the thread. Boom. If you do about every four, you'll be able to pull it apart. And now we're just gonna make sure that fold's not there and go over it again. You're gonna see me knot it again by going back and forth. And I'm gonna pay more attention and not think so much about what I'm gonna say next. I'm actually gonna put this on fast because I'm that girl. And I have no fear. Now I can't get a run away from you when it's on that fast. You have to know what you're doing and you have to be really experienced. It's like driving a car. And there I am, all the way through. So I've now sewn all the way around that inner circle. The next thing I have to do is take all my pins out. If you were taking your pins out as you went, you would already be done with this.
Okay, now I'm gonna finish this edge. I'm actually almost done. I have to find where the drawstring's gonna go through. First, I'm gonna lay this out. I'm gonna flip this up. I'm gonna fold that over, just like it's been ironed. And I'm gonna fold it one more time, like so. This is why this side is a little bit longer. It's so that it can go uh, all the way over the part that we just made. Now there's a lot of fabric there. It's not gonna be as hard for the rest of the circle. But I'm essentially gonna do that all the way around. Now, if it's pre-ironed like this one, it's a lot easier to do. If it's not pre-ironed, it can get off center. The fabric stretches, it shifts, it adjusts. You're trying to put a rectangular thing on a circular thing, even though it's not a very big circle or not very curvy, it's fairly straight. Um, it can still be a problem. So I always like to pre-iron my casing just because it makes sure the casing goes on straight. It makes it a lot easier for me. And I'm just pinning it down in place. And then I'm gonna sew as close to the edge as I can. I have to sew wide enough that I can get a safety pin through there because that's how I'm gonna run the drawstring through the skirt. If you're doing a cape and not a drawstring and you've got a cut up the front already, um, you don't need to actually have a drawstring. You could have a very small circle around the neck and uh, you wouldn't use the drawstring in that point. Um, this would just finish your edge. So you would, in that case, be using casing to finish the edge of the garment. If you buy really expensive clothing from a really high-end clothing dealer, and you look inside the clothing, you'll see that they have used a casing like this on every single seam. And that's one way to tell if it's a really nice piece of clothing. The reason they do that is it makes the clothing last a lot longer. Those seams will never come out. Now this part can be kind of tedious, especially if you're doing a lot of this. Um, you do have to stay focused, so it's a nice time to listen to music. Um, you can have a TV on in the background. I only watch Korean dramas, so I have to read the subtitles, so I can't watch TV and sew at the same time. But I do like to listen to music while I'm sewing. I'm dorky enough that I try to listen to music from the era of whatever it is I'm sewing. So <laughs> I make a lot of costumes. So I try to match the music to the era that I'm sewing in. I'm afraid this circle skirt is universal, so it would have no specific musical accompaniment. All right, I'm almost all the way around and I'm almost done with my skirt. You can see why this kind of project might be just the thing to get you started in sewing. You could sew it by hand as well. You don't have to have a machine. If you sew it by hand, it just takes a lot longer. But if your grandma has a machine at her house that she hasn't used for a while, and you're thinking about getting into sewing, but you don't want to totally commit, this is the kind of activity, the project that you could start with just to see how you feel about it. All right, I've got this pinned down now and double folded and that's important. It's not super neat. I guess I could make it super neat by folding this in a triangle like that. But that technique is kind of beyond the scope of this activity. You can find that technique online and in any number of sewing books. I want this gap here. That's where the drawstring is going to come out of the skirt. So I'm ready to go back to the sewing. 
I'm gonna slow this down because I have to sew really close to the edge of the fabric. I wanna sew as close to the edge of the fabric as I can. Now when you're first starting sewing, this is gonna be really hard, don't freak out. You're gonna to have to practice like you practice with anything. You are probably not gonna do it perfectly the first time. Your line is gonna go like all wiggly and to the left and right and you're really gonna to have to play with it. You can practice on things like pillowcases or just a strip of fabric until you get good at it. The slower you go, the easier it is, but don't freak out if you're not super good at staying right on the edge. You just need practice. So I'm gonna back up and now I'm ready to go forward. I'm gonna have to keep all those things in mind that I was keeping in mind before. So like, I really shouldn't try to talk to you and sew at the same time. I'm gonna have to keep the fabric out of the way and I'm gonna have to watch those pins. I'm really using my hands to guide the pins. I'm sorry, to guide the fabric over the pins and through the pins. I've got one hand on the top and one on the bottom. So close to done. So now I have a giant circle with a smaller circle cut out of the middle and a casing around the inner circle, the smaller one. And I finished with all the sewing part of this activity. The reason starting with the round tablecloth is so compelling and such a good idea is because I don't have to hem the bottom and I don't have to make any straight seams at all. I have just done all the sewing I have to do for this project. That was all the sewing. And now, this, this is why I have a magnet at home. I have a nice big skirt. Let me stand up so you can see. I've lost my shoe, it's never good. So I have a nice 
long skirt here on me. This would go all the way down to my ankles because I'm so tiny. See the tiny? And uh, all I have to do is put a drawstring in it so that I can gather it around my waist because thankfully this is a little big, but it's big enough to go over my hips. When you're making a drawstring anything, if you're putting a string in a casing, you want to use a safety pin. I'm going to use nice inexpensive ribbon. I should take a candle and burn the end of this ribbon so that it doesn't fray. But I don't have a candle here with me and fire is dangerous. So I'll just wait. Now the first thing I'm going to do is tie a knot in it so that it doesn't unravel while I'm putting it through the casing. There's the knot right there. And I've attached the safety pin to the, the ribbon. I'm just going to leave the ribbon on the spool. This is my casing. It really doesn't matter if I go left to right or right to left. I'm going to put my safety pin into that opening that I created. It's a little snug, but that's OK. And I'm going to push it through. I'm going to grab the head of the safety pin. And then I'm going to pull the ribbon through. I might have to work it a little bit at the beginning. Ooh, so snug. Okay, note to self. I won't be using a knot on the end of this because it's just too big for that very small opening. Let's try it one more time. I suppose I could get a smaller safety pin, but these are the safety pins I have. Now, I scrunch the casing up the safety pin, I grab the head of the safety pin, and I pull the thread through. When you're done, you may want to put a washing machine safe bead on the end of your ribbon so that it doesn't pull out. Although apparently all I need to do is put a knot. Every once in a while, your safety pin opens inside the casing and then you just have to close it without being able to see it and try not to get the fabric caught up in there. There's not a whole lot else that you can do in that case. You just have to make it work. I'm keeping the ribbon attached to the spool so I don't accidentally pull the, the ribbon all the way through. If I had less than 40 plus inches of ribbon, I could potentially pull the ribbon through one side and out the other, and then the one end would be stuck inside the casing and I'd have to start all over. If I keep it on the spool, then I can just, I have way more on the spool than I'm gonna need. Now I'm going to get to the tricky part. I have to get this pin all the way through this really tight opening. Oh, I can see it. There it is. See it peeking out. Can you see the peeking?
cut a little bit of extra ribbon, put a knot on each end to keep it from going inside the casing accidentally in the wash. And this garment is done. We have a nice big circle skirt with a drawstring waist. This is the same technique that's used in pajama bottoms. So if you, I'm just getting snips. If you are making pajama bottoms, you're gonna use the same technique at the top. You're just gonna have a wider casing. And uh, we'll do a wider casing in the next activity. I'm gonna cut all my little strings. It's safe to cut them really close to the fabric. If I was doing this garment for real, I would have used a red thread that wouldn't show up so much against the background or unless I was doing something artistic. My husband always teases me because I never cut my threads off and I always go out wearing clothes I've made with threads hanging off everywhere. Just can't be bothered. But anyway, there's our skirt. Now, this skirt is suitable for uh, everyday wear. Um, it's super durable. And um, it's also good for things like belly dancing, if you're into belly dancing or something like that. It's kind of a bohemian look. It's also adjustable, so you can wear it and your friends can wear it. Anyone can wear it that can fit inside this part over their hips. And uh, that's our first tutorial. Check out other videos that we're making at uh, thegeekgroup.org. This video was made possible by a grant from the Future Girl Foundation. This video was made possible by thousands of private donations from members and viewers like you. Please visit thegeekgroup.org for more information on how you can donate and become a part of our dreams of Avalon.